Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Tonight on our news, the citizenship hearing heats up. The search for a missing jet ski passenger intensifies. And are there signs of an early election? Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, the government is prepared to hold off on detaining or deporting anyone who may fall under Article 6 of the Constitution, while officials await a decision by the Privy Council on whether any person born in the Bahamas to a Bahamian parent, regardless of marital status, is entitled to citizenship, according to attorney Franklin Williams. Kyle Joaquin has the latest. The Court of Appeal has gone into deliberation to decide whether to grant a stay to the government so the status quo remains as a landmark decision by Supreme Court Justice Ian Winder heads to the Privy Council. Winder's 2020 ruling allowed children born out of wedlock to any Bahamian parent after July 9, 1973, regardless of their marital status, to be granted Bahamian citizenship at birth. The Court of Appeal upheld that ruling last month, with the Crown now taking it to the Privy Council in the UK. In the meantime, lead attorney Franklin Williams made the argument in the Court of Appeal today for things to remain as they are pending the Privy Council's decision. Williams said the government is even prepared to hold off on detaining or deporting people who may fall in this category under Article 6 of the Constitution. Justice Maureen Crane Scott questioned whether there is a need for a stay, and so did Justice Michael Barnett, who said the issue is whether you can deport a person who falls in the category pending the decision of the court. Justice Crane Scott questioned whether there is really any urgency in staying what was happening before Justice Winder. She said it doesn't appear as though there was anything moving while the Court of Appeal was waiting to hear this matter. The government's attorney said there is a necessity for staying this matter that goes beyond the five people spoken of in this case, but anyone spoken of in Article 6 of the Constitution. Justice John Isaacs asked if a stay is granted. Does that give others in similar situations the opportunity to make applications to sue the government? Attorney Wayne Monroe QC continues to argue that there is no need for a stay. Justice Barnett said the court will return with a decision as soon as it can. For our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. In other news, a former customs broker allegedly involved in a fraud scheme was hit with more than 100 charges during her arraignment in the magistrate's court today. Bethany McDermott has the details. 34-year-old customs broker Precious Moxie Miller pleaded not guilty to 114 fraud-related charges in the magistrate's court today. The Brick Knock subdivision resident was charged with 27 counts of fraud, 21 counts of stealing by reason of service, 34 counts of falsification of accounts, and 32 counts of uttering a false document. It's alleged that between January 3rd, 2018 and February 14, 2019, Moxie Miller obtained from Cable Bahamas Limited Royal Bank checks totaling around $1.4 million and stole more than $492,000 from Cable Bahamas by reason of service. Prosecutors also allege that between January 2, 2018 and February 14, 2019, the customs broker made false entries on the Bahamas Customs Department C-13 form, which she was required to maintain, purporting to show the bill of lading was co-signed to Cable Bahamas. The matter has been adjourned to Thursday morning. Until then, Mark Roxy Miller will remain in custody at the Nassau Street Police Station. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health is reporting two additional COVID-19 deaths on New Providence. A 57-year-old man died on July 11th and a 73-year-old woman died on June 28th. This brings the number of COVID-related deaths to 256, while 30 deaths remain under investigation. COVID-19 hospitalizations have also increased. 73 cases are now hospitalized, with five of them in the intensive care unit. And Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis is readying the troops for a general election that some insiders say could be called sooner rather than later. Kyle Joaquin takes a look at the hints party officials may have dropped along the way. Now, we understand there was a meeting here at FNM headquarters last night where the Prime Minister basically told the candidates to get ready to roll. During a meeting held at FNM headquarters Tuesday night, Minnis reportedly rallied the troops, advising the party's candidates to be ready as the time draws near. While Parliament has been adjourned to September 22nd, insiders close to the Prime Minister and to those running the party's re-election campaign have no expectation that the current Parliament will actually meet then. 
Despite promising a fixed election date on the campaign trail back in 2017, yet another election season is upon us, and only one man knows the date. We have no intentions of losing any of our seats. Since campaigning ramped up months ago by both major parties, Minnis has denied talks of an early election. However, in some FNM circles, there is widespread circulation that an election will be called in August, and Parliament could be dissolved soon. And if you'd listen back to a statement Minnis made in Parliament back in March while refuting something opposition leader Philip Davis said, the Prime Minister indicated that the notice could be as short as three weeks. The election is not due until May of next year. Then that changes the Bayman populace would know. Be they given three weeks notice, four weeks notice, six weeks notice, they would know. The Boundaries Commission met this morning via Zoom. Back in February, Minnis joked in Parliament about the date of a general election not being solely up to him. You think everybody ready? <laughs> Looking good. Looking yeah. good. If you think they're ready, if you think they're ready, I'll stand here now and ring the bell. I have to be advised by my team, though. <laughs> this, is, this is not a government in isolation. <laughs> During an event earlier this month, Minnis urged eligible voters to get registered as soon as possible. But it wasn't just the Prime Minister dropping hints. During the budget debate, Deputy Prime Minister Desmond Bannister, while throwing a jab at Pine Ridge MP Frederick McElpine, hinted that he wouldn't be a sitting MP come November, a sign that an election could be before then. You have a lot of time to be able to watch the trial. You have a lot of time. You don't have to come here at all. There have been multiple signs, even an early May memo for members of the armed forces to prepare. It was something National Security Minister Marvin Dames shut down with the swiftness. Now again, although there is a lot of speculation, only the Prime Minister knows for sure exactly when is the next general election. Reporting from FNM headquarters for Our News, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Thanks, Kyle. With new COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations on the rise, PAHO Director Dr. Carissa Etienne is warning against reopening the economy without having COVID numbers under control. Jasmine Brown reports. Countries should avoid thinking that they must make a choice between reopening the economies and protecting the health and well-being of their people. And we believe that this is a false choice. The PAHO director, who was responding to a question from our news team during a virtual PAHO press briefing on Wednesday, insists that balancing public health measures while reopening the economy has been a challenge for every country in the world. We have seen time and time again that full economic activity cannot resume unless we have the virus under control. And to attempt otherwise places lives at risk and extends the uncertainty brought by the pandemic. Health and well-being must be prerequisites for reactivating the economy in the context of COVID-19. Officials at Princess Margaret Hospital reported last week that the hospital had reached its capacity with COVID-19 patients. At last report, there were 67 people in hospital. 62 cases were listed as moderately ill and five cases in the intensive care unit. Etienne says if COVID-19 isn't brought under control, efforts to reactivate the economy will be an uphill battle. We know that public health measures work to control the spread of the virus. And each country needs to be responsive to their own national and local context and do the risk analysis that is necessary. We have already said that reactivating our economies must be done gradually and must be based on the evolving data about the viruses spread, about the health system's capacity. Data must always guide our actions against this virus. The state of emergency is set to end on August 13th, and Minister of Health Brandwood Wells says there are no plans to extend it. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Partly sunny skies today. Greg is in the Weather Center with the latest. Thanks, Christina. Welcome, everybody, for your Wednesday's first look at weather. We have some very warm conditions outside our studios, hazy conditions as well. Uh, your temperatures near the 80 degree mark, 81 outside our studios, northeast winds at six knots, and your face like temperature also in the mid to upper 80s. Satellite wise, we have that haze hanging out across the area that kept us pretty much dry and quiet for the day, but we do have a surge of wind coming across that's bringing some Atlantic moisture, bringing us a few showers and some clouds later on tonight through tomorrow. That's your first look of weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, thieves ransack a church sanctuary, plus the search for Drew Rigby intensifies. The details after this. 
every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. Search efforts for a 28-year-old man involved in a jet ski accident on Sunday have intensified, but not without criticism. Jared Higgs has more. Several groups have joined in the search for Drew Rigby, a 28-year-old engineer missing since a jet ski collision. Included in the search are Basra, a marine tow vessel, and vessels provided by Rigby's family. According to police, the 28-year-old was a passenger on a jet ski that collided with a 26-foot boat near Rose Island at around 7 p.m. on Sunday. He was ejected from the vessel and hasn't been seen since. Basra Operations Manager Captain Chris Lloyd says a large search party will hit the water on Wednesday evening until it gets dark. There's a really big effort this evening, uh, which is 72 hours after the incident. Uh, several boats. Basra, law enforcement, uh, drone with live video, uh, family, friends, uh, big effort at probably 5.30 to 8. In its statement, the Defense Force noted that it first responded to the crash after 7 on Sunday and suspended the search until after 9 due to nightfall and the weather. The search resumed the following day at 6.23 a.m., but some have slammed the durability of search and rescue efforts. National Security Minister Marvin Dames came under fire after he made comments suggesting the Bahamas had access to submersible drones, but that they were still in the testing phase, asking reporters, where would you put them? However, the RBDF statement confirmed that those submersible drones were eventually deployed on Tuesday. Since Monday and up until today, Defense Force divers have also been deployed. So we're, we're using the smaller vessels to do the search the rocks at Rose Island, the Salt Key, the larger vessels with towers to go into the cuts and the drone will be on the Basra rescue boat. Uh, in fact, there may be two or three drones um, in, the, in the immediate vicinity. But what we're going to do is mark the area so that really um, you don't need to go south of that area. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Meanwhile, thieves broke into a local church this week, ransacking the sanctuary and stealing thousands of dollars worth of equipment. It's the second time the place of worship has been hit by criminals. We get the story from Jillian Gray. A busted back door and ransacked sanctuary are not enough to shake this pastor. You can't take anything from God. Mm -hmm. God owns everything and you can take away and God will restore. Take away and God will restore. And so we, we just pray for those persons, you know, that have done it. On Monday, thieves stole $3,000 worth of screens and media equipment from Creative Christian Arts. But Dr. Ann Higgins says she and her husband are standing firm. The dynamic duo has been in ministry for 18 years, impacting the community through their Junkanoo Shack, Cultural Arts Center, and Community Center, which feeds over 1,500 people weekly during the pandemic. Every other week, we give 150 groceries out, even though we're back to work. Uh, we're still giving back to the community. So you would think, you know, giving back to the community and this community as well, that persons in the community would not want to take from mm -hmm. the persons that are always giving. But of course, that's the mentality of some persons. And we just pray that God would touch their heart and, and change their heart. This is the second break-in they've endured, but Dr. Higgins says they're not discouraged. We will continue the work that God has called us to do. We will not be discouraged. Um, as a matter of fact, again, this weekend, we will be giving out food uh, packages to persons that normally come and get. We will still continue to minister and teach the children music and dance and drama. What we do as a community center, we will continue to do, and we know that God will restore. Dr. Higgins says their goal is to raise enough capital to build a theater and amphitheater for classes and cultural shows to continue their work. Reporting for our news. I'm Jillian Gray. Ahead on our news, tracing a U.S. Congresswoman's deep Bahamian roots, plus DeAndre Ayton heads into Game 4 of the Finals. Stay tuned. 
every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. This is our news. Welcome back. They say you can take the girl out of the island, but you'll never take the island out of the girl. Truer words have never been spoken about U.S. Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, who has ascended to high levels of American politics, but still honors her deep Bahamian roots. She spoke with Vonique Toot. I learned how to be a strong black woman from a strong black Bahamian woman, and I tell that everywhere. She is known internationally for her wide brim colorful hats and being the voice for the voiceless. But few people know of U.S. Congresswoman Frederica Wilson's deep Bahamian roots. Born in Miami, Florida in 1942, the U.S. House of Representatives members' maternal grandparents are Bahamian. It's something she's immensely proud of. All of the um, characteristics I've received from my forefathers that made me the person I am today. It came from my mother, my grandmother, Frederica Roberts from the Bahamas. So because Frederica Roberts from the Bahamas was such a role model, she was a small business owner who owned row houses in Overtown. She first came from the Bahamas. And she taught me how to be strong, how to fight, how to not be how to not uh, fear any man. It's that Bahamian upbringing that compelled the educator turned veteran politician to visit the Bahamas in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian in 2019 to find out how U.S. Congress could assist. Wilson, who considers herself the first Bahamian elected to Congress, then held a fundraiser in South Florida to help survivors of the monster storm. The Florida representative also fought for a bill that would grant temporary protected status to Bahamians in the aftermath of Dorian for 18 months. Wilson was honored for her determination to assist her Bahamian brothers and sisters during a Bahamas Gumbe celebration in Miami Gardens on Saturday. I want to pay homage to all of the black Bahamian women whose shoulders we stand on, who helped us become what we are today, who led the way and showed us that whatever we set our minds to, we could become. She had this message for Bahamians. Hold your heads up high. Be proud. Be proud to be a Bahamian. Be proud at what your nation has accomplished and all of the items have accomplished. Reporting from Miami, Florida for our news, I'm Vonique Tude. Thanks, Vonique. Well, the Suns and DeAndre Ayton look to take a 3-1 to one lead in the NBA Finals tonight. Marcellus Hall has that tonight in sports. All right, thanks a lot. Welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. Everybody's going to be sitting in front of their television screens tonight. At least NBA fans will, and most Bahamian sporting fans. That's because Game 4 of the NBA Finals comes your way this evening with DeAndre Ayton and the Phoenix Suns looking to take a 3-1 lead in the best of seven series. Let's take a look. DeAndre Ayton and the Phoenix Suns will take their show on the road once again tonight as the Bucks and the Suns play Game 4 of the NBA Finals. Phoenix up 2-1, to one, looking to bounce back from a Game 3 loss when they fell to the Milwaukee team 120-100. to 100. Phoenix will try to find a way to stop Giannis Antetokounmpo, who had 41 points in that game to help lead Milwaukee to the victory. Chris Paul, meanwhile, trying to get back on track. He had 19 points in losing cause. DeAndre, of course, will also try to be a staple in this one. It's going to be a tough task. Of course, the Suns trying to make this a 3-1 lead, heading back to Phoenix. Milwaukee looking to even things up. It will be a tough challenge, but of course, somebody will have to win. Fingers crossed for our Bahamian boy, DeAndre Ayton, as he and Phoenix on the road tonight for Game 4 of the NBA Finals.
And there you are, your look on sports. Don't forget to check out as well the WNBA's three-point shootout featuring John Quell Jones. We'll tell you how she does as well this evening. As then give you an update on DeAndre Ayton and the Phoenix Suns. That's all coming up for you tomorrow. That's your check. Once again, I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you. Thanks, Marcellus. Still to come, how the Red Cross is helping to save lives. Stay with us. Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. Welcome back to our news. There may be some rain ahead. Greg is back in the Weather Center with the details. Thanks again, Christina, and welcome back, everybody, for your second look at weather. We have an upper-level trough that's spinning just to the east of the island. Remember, we had one a few days ago. That one is actually well to the east, west of us. This one will actually track to the west, sparking some showers across the southeast Bahamas. We could see some increase in shower activity across the northwest and central Bahamas as the system gets near us. National Hurricane still watching an area to the north of us that's going to be moving away, giving it a low chance for formation. The remainder of the tropics very quiet right now, and that's the way we like it. Boating forecast for all areas tonight through tomorrow. Your winds will be out of the east, northeast to east, southeast at 15 to 20 knots. Caution flag still posted. Four to six foot seas. High tide will be at 11.57 tonight. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Monday. That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe night, everybody. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Greg. Finally tonight, the Bahamas Red Cross has launched a new certification program providing job opportunities to anyone over age 18. Resource Mobilization and Communications Manager Lori Major says the nonprofit launched an accreditation lifeguard certification program to help build a more resilient Bahamas. As part of our strategy 2030, um, in which we want to build a more resilient Bahamas. And we thought a big part of that would be to promote life-saving skills and to, we really think that beaches on the family islands and in Nassau need to be guarded by a lifeguard. And we thought that it's also a good certification that could allow persons within the economy to find jobs. Training for the one-week program is available on New Providence, Abaco, Exuma, and Grand Bahama. Major says the response has been overwhelming. Even for other family islands, if they're interested and they have a group of 10 or more, we can make provisions. So persons can still inquire if they have an interest in certifying themselves in this capacity on family islands. And we're really proud of the program because it's a locally accredited program. We have been certified through the American Red Cross. Um, and you don't have to travel abroad or bring trainers from abroad anymore to get the certification. You can do it right here. In fact, if you want to be recertified, you can also do it here. Contact the Red Cross for more information. And thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Christina Dragovich. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.